Hi everyone, and welcome back to this comprehensive video series covering all things 3D modeling in Clip Studio Paint. If you haven't seen the previous videos in this series, please check them out so you can catch up with us. And with that being said, let's continue. The next subject we'll be discussing is the tool property settings. It can be found just by clicking this wrench and this window will pop up. The first category is operations. I'm just going to go through the ones that I think are the most important. We've already gone through selection mode, which is just adding more than one model to your selection and then manipulating it. This is just click between models. This one is to add selection, that one's to minor selection. Pretty easy. Snap is just the magnet that we've already discussed. This is important. So let's get our chair up. There we go. Just worry about this one and this one. This is based on how you will move a model when you have more than one selected. That was a bit of a mouthful, but bear with me. So let's select both models. And right now, as you'll see, the sphere is aligned with the door. So when we move everything, you can see that it's almost pivoting on the door itself. The, the chair is moving more than the door because it, again, imagine like a little nail, the door is connected to the nail and we're just rotating it around, right? However, if we select the midpoint, all of a sudden the sphere is moved between the selection. So now it's moving around the midpoint of both our models. The next is the movement and rotation of the axes. And what I mean by that, we're going to get rid of our chair first because we don't need it anymore. And we're going to focus on this sphere. When we rotate the model, the sphere remains the same. It doesn't move with the model. The arrows are still pointing right, left, and the rotation spheres are exactly the same as well. So the door is going to be on a very odd angle when we do it like that. But let's get it back to normal. And when we change it to object axis on both rotation and movement, when we rotate the object, you see the sphere is actually moving with it. And look, now the arrows are pointing in the direction of the model. Now there are benefits for both of these, which is why I have them selected because I will change between them depending on how I want the model to move. But it's a very good tool to have either or either. Both have benefits. That's all for operation, now let's go to the object list. This is essentially what we discussed before. This little wrench will bring up this. It's just an overview of everything that you have in space. You can duplicate objects, so we've got another door and we move that across, we've got two. And you can also delete it from here as well. And you can actually access the parts of a model in this menu. As you can see, this chair doesn't have any parts. The only time a model will have parts is if there's a drop down arrow available. So this one won't have any movable parts, but the door is going to have a lot. One of the best things about this menu right here is if you want to get rid of a part, let's say I don't want the window frame, I can click it and it will show up in the list. So even if you can't read Japanese or Chinese or Korean, whatever language model is in, from whoever made it, you'll still be able to find what you want and you can get rid of it. Now, all these are just these. So if I choose that, it'll show up, right? So we'll keep that and I don't want the wall. So I'm gonna click the wall and then it shows up here. And I don't want this giant frame part either. So get rid of that. And that's the door frame. So I do want that. And the opposite is also true. If I see something in the list, I say, oh, okay. Rasu. That's a glass. So if I select it, it will show up. So that entire thing right there is the glass pane. And so it's very helpful considering you, you can change the name of the model, but you can't change the name of the parts by double clicking, which it's very annoying. Next category is allocate. Now this is exactly the same as the object list, except it appears here. So if I get rid of it, if I click the eye here, it'll disappear from here. It's good to have that because you can access the object list quickly and you can also do everything you can do in the object list here. So duplicate, delete, select, all that sort of stuff. Do it all here. Object scale is essentially this ring to make it bigger or smaller. And if you uncheck fixed scale, 
it works the same as these. So if we want to make it taller, then we use the Y. Okay. And we go up. And we can reset it right here. So these, again, this is a uh, position on the ground. Same as this one to place it back on the ground level. And again, yeah, so redundant, especially considering we've got these arrows. That's why I don't have them visible, because it's a bit pointless. And rotate, again, the same as the sphere. Camera. Now, this is a new feature with the 10 days ago updates. This is really a really intuitive feature that I never even gave it much thought, to be honest. But now that we have it, it's actually quite good. So imagine you have a scene and the scene is a, an overhead shot. So we've got, let's bring in our human as well. Get him over here. And we'll put him on the floor. Rotate him. What you can do is you can duplicate a camera, rename it something else. I like to say fiddle, just because I like to fiddle around with it. And we can lock this. So we'll go onto this camera and we'll move it a bit get everything in frame and we can lock it and then we can go to this view and say I want to move this guy over a bit he's still a bit weird and I don't think he's quite on the floor I think I want to rotate him a bit I don't know he's a bit wonky this isn't a very good model anyway so we can fiddle around with the the entire scene to get everything the way it needs to be so maybe I want to move his head a bit move his arm back no, just play around with it. Maybe we want the lighting to be a little nicer. And what we can do is we can go back to the camera that we locked and we've still got the same shot. Basically, so if you're setting up a panel in your comic and you know how you want it to look, it, it's a downward shot like this, and you want it to be like that always, but you also need to get better angles to fix up your models. This is great because the angle will always be the same on your locked layer but you can also select this other layer to move about the canvas and fix your models so that's great i'm going to be using this one a lot and just by clicking these you can lock the layers so that see when you lock it the camera controls can't be selected and i can't use any of the shortcuts either on my mouse next is the preset which is here it's just the angles so again a bit redundant Perspective is important. If you have a mouse that has a scroll wheel, that's also the shortcut for this. So if we zoom in, we can get some really warped perspective, which is great. But if you want just a standard for small models, four or maybe 4.5 even tends to look nice. The bigger the model, the more perspective you'll probably need. So I've used some big models before, like entire buildings, and they look quite flat if you have it at a low perspective. Around 11 is a good one to have for bigger models. It's up to you, honestly. If you want your comic or your drawing to have just extreme perspective and angles to have it stylized like that, go ahead. So next is roll. And this is under camera, so that should give you a hint. It's the camera, not the models that are turning. And this is literally turning the entire horizon line. And what I mean like that is, look at that. The grid itself is on its side. So that's a pretty cool angle for a comic, you know? So imagine yourself holding the camera and you just tilting it to get a really cool angle. And so zero is the mid-ground, plus goes right, minus goes left. So plus, we're going right, and minus is to the left. Hi guys, sorry for the interruption, but if you're enjoying this video and it's helping you, please give it a like and a share so others can find it. What helped you might help someone else. If you could also subscribe, that'd be great too. There'll be plenty of videos in this series, so click that big black button below so you don't miss a single one. If you have any questions, pop them down in the comment section below and I'll answer them as best I can. The object tool. This is completely redundant because all these appear on the object launcher bar. We've got the texture, we've got the layout, and we've got movability. All three of them right here, and then we have the reset, so that's there as well. So yeah, don't need to bother with that. Outline is a, like a pen line around your model. So if I make it really big, let's go like 90 and put the opacity up, there's a black kind of line. Let me make it bright red so you can see it better. And obviously it's gonna depend on the angle. Now, I don't really see the purpose of this. It might be a good way to categorize your models. So like maybe all your doors are red 
or if you have certain characters, that might actually be good for this. So say I have an OC, my original character, and their name's Ben. I don't know. Ben. And he will always be in blue. So I know who he is in the panel. If there's multiple characters, that might be a good way of using this. But otherwise, I don't really utilize this. Again, it's up to you. That's the freedom. So you can uncheck this and it will go away. And that's usually what I do. Next is shadows. So the light source is the bread and butter for a CSP models. If you don't have it ticked, it's probably going to show up poorly on your canvas like this. And if I do it on the man as well, you get a very kind of flat, odd looking image. Some models actually look really good without a light source. Just try it. Try what looks best for the scene. Cast shadows on the ground. Pretty self-explanatory. There we go. It appears on the ground. If I untick it, there we go. This is also recent. So this came in the last big update. Now let's get our light source up here. So this is the light source sphere. I'll get to this in a second, but if you drag, click and drag and move around, the light will change. And as you can see, the shadow on the ground is also moving and changing. Now this is fantastic for outdoor scenes. When the sun is setting, you have a light post and you need to cast shadow on the ground in perfect perspective. It's tricky. There is actually like a, I don't want to say mathematical equation, but I guess it is in how to draw shadows properly on the ground, how they cast. You can actually Google that if you want, but this just makes it so much easier and quicker. That's the whole point of 3D models is not to replace knowledge, but to just make everything much more streamlined because we live in the real world where there are deadlines and we've got to get stuff done and we got to do it quick. So that's what cast shadow is. So if I click the man and we put a cast shadow on him as well, there you go, there he's, there's his shadow. The light is obviously coming from behind him and it's quite low because his shadow is long. So if he had a short shadow, the light would be higher up in the sky, like a noon kind of situation. Again, you don't have to have this shadow because it can be a little specific. <laughs> if, if I was drawing a panel right now and the sun was directly above my character, I would just do a little shadow. It wouldn't be as specific as that, not even close. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of the cast on the ground just because it can get a bit distracting sometimes. So the next one is light source. So I've already explained that this is the light source sphere. Essentially, where you see shadow on the sphere is where the shadows will appear on your models. So right now the light is actually coming a little to the right, coming down that way. And how you move it is you just click and drag. It can take a little while to get used to, but Right now, the light is shining directly on our models. We can change this to get some spooky lighting. And here is the color. So we can change the color directly and give it a very spooky glow now. I tend to avoid changing the color of ambient light. If I want to get dual colors, I will add an additional directional light color. So that's just up in the object list right here. See, I told you you could see it much better on a human model. It's almost like a neon light behind him and the light from inside this door is red, so it's great to have directional light, that ability. You just look at the, the male model and see how useful that would be for colouring guides. Just know how light falls. You can get some really realistic lighting. So let's get rid of that and go back to light source. And we'll just return to white for now. And we can change the intensity, which is great. So if we have super bright light, you can just go absolutely ham and drive it all the way up. So that is light. That's very important because when you extract lines, again, we'll go into that way later down the line. Lighting and shadow actually play a part in that. Okay, so now we have the panorama. Now this is basically the ability to convert a 2D picture into a 3D panorama. So it's an all-inclusive kind of environment. I'm not going to go into that because I don't really use it. There many tutorials on panoramas online. Preferences, rendering settings. Uh, I use this one a lot. So again, you have the outline here. The texture is just that, uh, getting rid of this or not. So let's get out of here and let's say I change the door to this color instead. If I go to rendering settings and turn off texture, it will just be uh, white, blank, which is great because some models actually come with textures that you can't take off, which is very annoying because it can affect line extraction. So having the ability to have a base 
of just white is very helpful and useful. Apply a lighting. So apply light source is what we did before. So if you turn it off, you'll get a very bland image. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but Gurand or Guraud, Guraud, Fong and Toon are just ways of coloring. So Fong and Guraud are quite similar. You can't really notice a difference. Toon is like posterization. So you actually, will, it's like cell shading. That's, yeah, that's the best way I can describe it, Toon. So it's much easier to see on a human model. So I will click Ben. Is that what I called him? Yeah, I'll click Ben. And so you might be able to see the difference between Fong and him. Uh, see, Groud, Groud and Fong can't really see a difference. You might be able to on different models, but Toon you can definitely see. See how it's just harsher? It's essentially cell shading, Toon, animation kind of thing, cartoon. I always just keep it on Groud. Cast shadow on the ground, same thing. Uh, back face culling. Now this has something to do with 3D modeling in general. I'm not just talking about CSP, so Blender, Unity, all that sort of stuff. I honestly have no idea what it really means. Like I couldn't describe it to you. It essentially means sometimes there will be faces of your model that will be see-through uh, for whatever reason. Um, but sometimes uh, unchecking this will show those faces and you'll be able to see it. You'll notice that if your model is looking weird and there's like transparent bits where there shouldn't be, come into rendering settings and uncheck back face culling. It turns the faces that are transparent, non-transparent. This is generally for clothing. If you have a model that has gravity, it's more for clothy kind of things. I don't use it. I assume you would only use it if you are really deep into 3D modeling. And I always just keep this on fast. And that's it for this video. So please subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Uh, if you have any questions, pop them down in the comment section below and I'll answer them as best I can. Don't forget to like and share and thank you for watching. Bye.